Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. Today we're going to look at some unreal venomous snake TikToks. I'm going to tell you what I think about these, but what I'd really like would be to hear from you in the comments. Let's dive in. They saw a couple of clips of Russell's Vipers and that amazing kind of jump back they can do. I think for their size, they're, they're quite a stocky snake really, that is pretty incredible. That is kind of the agility you'd expect from a whip snake or a uh, perhaps a racer. But they're a stocky, stout bodied snake and they can just fly at you basically. They're an incredible species, probably a species I don't feature enough on this channel. Close call with a deadly Ow, viper. Yeah. Look how close this thing gets to my foot. This is a Gabino viper. Rhino viper crossed with a hybrid. Ow, yeah. Insanely close. You can see in this slow motion, it literally touched my croc. That was very, very close. That would have been a major accident. Even with anti-venom, that would have been a hell of a week. Or longer, possibly. Um, that's a guy who I've commented on his videos previously. Before doing this, I didn't know anything about clout or anything like that and it upset people that I said he took risks but he seems like a nice guy who loves his animals and I don't really think that he would tell you what he does is without risk either. I just got bit by the biggest rattlesnake species in the world. This is a video I never thought I would have to make. While down in Florida looking for bugs and reptiles in their natural habitat I took a step that I'll never forget. I was out looking for scorpions with a black light and I did not see a large eastern diamondback curled up by a tree. She was camouflaged very well. This is Venom Man. He's a guy that I feature on this channel regularly because I like his content. And I find that he's generally got a respectful, safe way of handling his snakes. He really loves them, he really looks after them. But here he's come unstuck and it kind of goes to show that it could happen to anyone really. This is what my leg looks like six days after the bite, right after getting out of the hospital. All my joints are completely stoved up. I'm extremely swollen, discolored, and uh, the pain is very intense. I am anemic at this stage. There's not enough red blood cells in my body, so I'm getting very winded doing even the most basic task. As you can see, um, I cut some of the clip out because of the length, but he got appropriate treatment really quickly. They were on the phone to the hospital. They said they need a toxicologist. They need Crofab. And he got treatment, but even with treatment, I mean, there's just there's such a damaging bite. It's such a highly venomous and large species. And the thing is, like, you could say he should have been wearing leg gaiters or other protective gear like that. But in Florida, it's really, you know, it's muggy. It's seriously hot. Realistically, if you go herping, you're probably not going to wear protective gear all the time. If you do try and wear the gear, you'll overheat or the gear will be waterlogged in no time at all. So, yeah, sometimes accidents happen. And to be honest, I've been seen in Florida myself without protective gear on. Overall, really, the, the Eastern Diamondback, it's not a super common species. You're not expecting to step on them every five minutes, but it's just pot luck sometimes. Just tickle with Puff Adder's chin. <laughs> Here's a guy we've just seen tickling a puff adder. Puff adders have what I would categorize as a very, very nasty, mostly cytotoxic venom. Um, so again, even with anti-venom, it would be a horrible bite. And he's uh, he seems quite brave with these snakes, but in the next clip we'll see that he actually gets bitten by a wild copperhead. Thumb, looking beautiful. Nice and turning purple. Chunky as hell, hand, chunky as hell, arm, chunkier than hell. As you can see, he got bit by a wild copperhead, probably herping, I'm guessing. He's not stupid, he knows the risks, he knows what can happen, and I mean, it has happened, fortunately not with a puff adder, but he does continue to handle his snakes. I've seen some of his other videos and he handles them regularly, free handles them. And it really makes you wonder, like, like I say, this is someone who isn't stupid, but why do they keep doing it? What is the need here? And what is going on psychologically that makes some of us feel the need to do this stuff? And one of the coolest things about these reptiles is they're mildly venomous. Their rear fangs are uniquely designed in that they're used to deflate toads. And in many instances, a toad will puff up its body to seem bigger. That also makes it a lot more difficult to swallow. Well, when you're a snake that has big, long rear fangs and you use those fangs to pop holes in the toad, 
it deflates, and then of course it can swallow down that prey item. Cody Peterson being very educational there. I don't know if he stuck the snake on his face afterwards or not, but in any case, Eastern hognose snakes are a really cool species. They've got those enlarged rear fangs to pop toads and inject a bit of venom. Well, inject, let it let it run in down the grooves, I guess. They're an Epispoglyphus snake which I find very hard to say. And they are a very, very cool species. Their fangs do look kind of dangerous when you see them like that, but I still to this day have never met someone who's actually got an Eastern hognose snake to bite them. Love a snake molester at work. Honestly, with the king cobras, I always just wonder is anyone watching this stuff and thinking, is the snake enjoying this? Because to my eyes, I don't think the snake is enjoying that. All right, let's Ready? see how much venom this snake is going to give us. So we'll see. Like I said, we'll have her bite multiple times. And there she goes. There Whoa, she goes. my goodness. And king cobra venom, you can see that deep, beautiful yellow. And, um, so as you can see, as she's chewing, she's injecting a little more venom each time. And we're probably looking at, oh gosh, three or 400 milligrams of dry weight here. And we think about 20 milligrams of king cobra venom as a lethal dose, so. There's the attractiveness of king cobras, or at least part of the attractiveness for people that like to do snake shows and other types of reptile showmanship, if you like. They are technically on paper a very deadly snake. But in reality, they're not always particularly aggressive, or defensive, as I should say. And they're a very big snake that moves in quite predictable ways. They go upright, they hood up, they stand up, they strike forwards and down, lunge down. They have less flexibility when their hood is up to bite upwards, so you can kiss them on top of the head and do stuff like that. And they've got these other ways of moving, they're quite rigid and they're kind of make themselves a bit predictable. I'm not saying it's risk-free, it's extremely risky handling them, but they are a bit predictable. They're big and you can see what they're gonna do. And if you know them, like a lot of these people do, you can make it look quite showy and quite risky. And really the equivalent is like if I was to run up and swing a big haymaker at a guy who does boxing all the time, he'd see it coming a mile away. And that's the point you can get to with these snakes with not too much training really, just practice. A toddler bit a cobra to death in India after the venomous snake attacked him. Two-year-old Govinda Kumar had been playing at his home when the snake appeared, before it began to coil its three-foot body around the child's hand after it grabbed the snake. But instead of screaming, the child began to bite down on the cobra's head. Once the child's grandmother spotted the boy biting the snake, she quickly removed the snake from the boy, which died immediately from the bite, and took the child to hospital after he ate part of the snake and took on some of his venom, before later being discharged. I'd be curious to meet this kid in 20 years time, see what he's like. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I wouldn't like to. But anyway, that is a story I honestly know nothing more about it than what I've seen in that clip there. If anyone's got additional info on how it happened and what the aftermath was, I know the kid was fine. Some reports said he was envenomated, others said he wasn't, but I know he's okay. That's the main thing. By the way, if you do enjoy this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, but also don't forget that there is an email link in the bio if you want me to comment on anything, you can just send in the links and I'll get them in the next video if I can. I have so many questions about that clip. I guess it was an equatorial spitting cobra, or some people call it the black spitting cobra. Um, and it just got him right in the eye as he was poking it and prodding it and visibly trying to get a reaction. There is a cytotoxic component in their venom. I don't think it's good to have it in your eyes. I think it could cause blindness, but he washes it out quickly. With some of these clips, particularly from that account as well, I'm, I'm almost curious as whether he would do this on purpose. I'm not saying he did, but it raises questions. It makes you wonder after a while. I've had him forever. He's my baby and he's, he's wonderful. He's so, so you know what he'll do? You can take him out and he'll, uh, we can, he'll crawl into like a cart and he'll coil up in the cart and he'll stay there for hours and just watch people. They saw Kevin McCurley and Clint 
So Kevin McCurley is someone, I know he's got his detractors, but he is someone who's had a massive impact on the pet trade, on the pet hobby, in the US particularly, there's, there's no other way to say it. And Clint, I would say, is my favourite YouTuber, Clint's proving how brave he is there, but he didn't really have to do that for my respect, because he has such a high level of critical thinking that it's just a joy to watch his channel. Gördüğünüz bu ilan ülkemizde yayılmış nehen gürze cinsine ait olan liman gürzesidir. Çok tehlikeli. They saw a blunt-nosed viper, which I was fortunate enough to encounter in Cyprus. And this is another one of those clips where someone's doing something educational, but when you look closely at the clip, you really start to wonder about the welfare of the snake. That's a snake that's acting very limp as he holds it, it's very exhausted. And that tube you can see coming forward is the glottis. Glottis connects to the trachea and helps it get air down basically when it's in distress or when it's swallowing something large. And the way it's pushing that glottis forwards like that, it really makes me think that it is in respiratory distress and he's gripping it very, very hard. And what can happen sometimes is he's not going to suffocate it to death, hopefully. But often when you squeeze them that tight, you can cause damage to the soft tissue to the cartilage. It could be an infection in a week's time. It's really just, you know, it's it's too much. If you're not comfortable handling the animals, I'm not comfortable handling a lot of these snakes because I don't want to and I just don't feel like I need that kind of risk, then you just simply don't do it. Who wins between a black mamba and a king cobra? <laughs> I gotta get in on this. Let's start with the king cobra. It's the largest venomous snake on planet Earth, getting up to 20 feet long. That is a two-story building noodle. And the black mamba, being the closest living relative to the king cobra, is the second largest venomous snake on planet Earth. They get up to about 15 feet long. They also have way more potent of venom. They have a 100% fatality rate if the bite goes untreated, and it only takes 30 minutes for your lights to go out. However, unlike the Black Mamba, the King Cobra is highly resistant to other snakes' venom. Well, what does everyone think? I'm actually curious about everyone's answers on this one. Personally, I think the King Cobra would win if it actually caught the Black Mamba, and if it got over the slight problem of living on a completely different continent. Wow. <laughs> Imagine letting a, a mildly venomous snake chew on your neck for a minute or so for views. That's just taking it to a level it shouldn't be at, it, frankly. I mean, obviously he needs to make a living and everything, but yeah, it's just not for me. I think now we need a palate cleanser. We need to see someone who's actually truly educational for a change. Before anti-venom be became available for this species, it was like a 60% chance you were going to die if you got whacked by one. <laughs> Sometimes people survive bites from these guys. It's hard to know how correct the records were though, because um, you know a lot of the time with these guys is they bite and they don't actually envenomate. So like, um, you know, I just put him on again and he didn't really give anything. He's making a good point there. There's always statistics thrown around about snakes and snake bites and lots of other subjects, quite frankly, but a statistic doesn't always give you the whole picture. You need to dissect it and understand. The fatality rate could actually be close to 100% when it's not a dry bite. These are interesting things to think about. Buffalo is an iconic, you know, uh, African snake. It's found pretty much throughout Africa, but yet we don't know things. And the beauty about this thing is just like, we just set up some video cameras that were recording what they were doing, and we find that. That's the beauty of actually watching animal in nature. See, they will set themselves up uh, and lie in a bush uh, until prey comes by. Now, what's critical is actually, is for the snake to be able to draw the prey towards it. And they've actually evolved a mechanism, in that case, the lingual luring behavior, which actually allows them to draw the prey towards them, at which point, when the prey is actually close enough, they actually strike and catch it. The person we're watching is Xavier Glodas, who is the researcher who discovered lingual luring in puff adders. I'll just watch the next clip and talk a little bit more about it. Well, the lingual luring, so the, the use of the tongue as a lure, the tongue is actually extended out of the mouth for about eight seconds on average, and it varies from three seconds all the way to 30 seconds. We initially spotted, we just discovered those, uh, those lingual luring based on the fact that the tongue was, was, you know, was extended out of the mouth for so long. A subscriber recently said to me in a comment, are you aware of lingual luring in puff adders? To be honest, 
aside from being aware of it existing, I really don't know much more about it. I haven't had time to read this study yet. So the best I can do is add a link in the description to an article that references this study a bit better and hopefully will give you a good picture of what's going on. Anyway, that was the video for today. I really hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll be back next week for another one. Thank you very much.